Hey everybody, Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're going to talk about clearing rifle malfunctions in low light. So before we get into to this, uh, two general lighting conditions can exist, and that's no light, meaning there is not enough light for you to see uh, well to, to your rifle's ejection port, uh, which is going to be our main source of visual diagnostics, and it's something that we may or may not even realize that we use when we're clearing malfunctions uh, when there is a sufficient lighting to see the rifle itself. That's a no light situation, so you'd be using white light pushing out into a dark environment, or you'd be using night vision devices which can complicate fixing and diagnosing malfunctions because of that near far focus issue that night vision devices have. Uh, low light is a situation where there is enough ambient lighting that I could potentially be able to at least see or get a really good idea visually of what's going on with my rifle. But I don't want to practice and train uh, for one of those two lighting conditions to exist. I want to kind of assume worst case scenario so I'm better, better prepared to clear the malfunction in the event that I have to reload the rifle when there is no light on the gun, ambient lighting or anything like that. Uh, visual diagnostics definitely aid greatly in clearing malfunctions, but the rifle will tell you what's most likely wrong with it without that visual input, which is how we're going to diagnose most likely malfunctions and start to clear them under low light conditions. Another thing, another caveat, if you will, that we need to address is the fact if I only have a rifle or if I have a rifle and a handgun. If I have a rifle and a handgun, I have a secondary weapon system, if I experience a malfunction on my rifle and I feel, okay, I don't really know what's going on with the gun, I'm going to go ahead and make that transition get my handgun out. If my handgun has a weapon mount of light and I turn it on because I've been using weapon lights because the environment is dark and I go ahead and finish the drill or finish the engagement or whatever, I now have a light source that can help me diagnose the problems of the rifle before making the transition back to it. So me being cross, cross lateral, if you'll notice, rifle right, pistol left, this makes life very, very easy for things like this. I can go ahead and remount the rifle and bring that weapon light back to splash light my chamber, get an idea of what's going on. Then I can go ahead and holster the pistol up and perform my malfunction clearance, whatever it happens, whatever the malfunction happens to be. Even if you're same side lateral, right-handed, right-handed, you can do the same thing. It's as simple as, okay, I make my transition, handguns out. When it's time to come back, I go ahead and remount my support hand first, reseat the rifle, check chamber condition without flagging yourself. All it takes is literally you can angle the rifle or the handgun up at a 45 or 50 degree angle. You can still get enough splash lighting from your uh, weapon light to see the chamber. I can go ahead and holster my pistol up and then perform whatever malfunction clearance I have to. Working under the assumption that I don't have time to transition to a handgun, or maybe I don't have a handgun, is how we're going to discuss clearing these malfunctions under low light or no light conditions. I like to work from most likely to least likely, so I like to address what's most likely going to happen and then work my way towards what's, what's least likely. Still possible, but less likely to occur. Uh, on the AR platform, especially with direct impingement, we've got three common types of malfunctions that can occur, and a fourth one that can happen, God forbid it does, but it's actually pretty easy to fix. We've got failure to fire, which is either there wasn't a round in the chamber, or the round in the chamber is bad, or maybe the bolt carrier group wasn't seated, or any number of considerations can cause that to happen. Generally, it's a no round or a bad round in the chamber. The second one is what's commonly referred to as a double feed. Uh, you also hear that in regards to pistols, but on rifles it actually is true definition of double feed. Two rounds are trying to load into the stagger fed, from a stagger fed magazine into a stagger fed chamber or an alternating fed chamber at the same time. Could be two, could be three, could be five, could be ten rounds trying to go in there all at the same time, uh, which is sometimes a complicated malfunction to fix. 
Uh, and then you have a variation on a stovepipe, maybe the rifle short cycling, maybe you encountered a, a round, wasn't able to completely exit the uh, chamber or the ejection port because the rifle was put in close proximity to another object, such as shooting from the, the fetal position or broke pack prone or whatever you call it, junkyard prone. And it just kind of didn't all get all the way out and bounced right back in the gun or any number of reasons that that can happen. Or somebody helped you induce the malfunction with some kind of malfunction stick or something like that. And then our last malfunction is what's referred to as a bolt holdover or bolt override or brass over bolt. I wish we could call, agree on a name so I could, you know, everybody be on the same page, but that's terminology, right? If I say high port, everybody's got nine different ideas of what that is. So those are the malfunctions we'll cover really quick. And what we're going to focus on is tactile diagnostics. One of the best training aids you can get for practice like this is some action trainer rounds. They're cheaper than snap caps. It's a brass, in the case of the rifle, it's brass casing. It's a polymer tip round, and you can use these to practice whatever malfunction you want to practice. And you can randomly feed them into your magazines, do whatever you want to do. So if I have a failure to fire, addressing that as the first malfunction, it's going to feel dramatically different from some of the other malfunctions and the fact that I get a trigger press. Uh, I may not hear the click, especially if I'm shooting without ear pro or just not in the moment, but I know what a dry fire or a dry press feels like. So right now I know what's most likely wrong with the gun. I can also further verify that by attempting to sweep the safety with my thumb. It's always good practice to put the rifle on safe anytime you're going to be doing any significant manipulations. In this case, I can't do that. So if I'm coming off my momentary only or my constant on, I know that the malfunction is most likely a failure to fire. Again, if there's no secondary weapon, I'm gonna perform my normal clearance procedure, which is a push-pull and a rack. At this point, the rifle will go back on a safe, which means the hammer is charged, which means it's now Schrodinger's chamber again. The next round will or won't fire until I pull the trigger. If I have a second malfunction, if I get a second click, push-pull, rack again, now I might have something else going on with the gun that would uh, kind of uh, make me want to find another firearm. And the next malfunction is where things start to get a little bit more complicated, the double feed. Uh, I generally set double feeds up differently, a lot of different ways. I'll take two casings or maybe one casing and I'll just go ahead and drop them in the chamber, not really looking, and I'll go ahead and hit that bolt release. The safety still sweeps. First, the trigger's gonna feel different, so I'm off. Now I've got what's known as a dead trigger or a free hang trigger, a no spring resistance trigger, whatever you want to call it. The trigger behaves dramatically differently. It's going to feel differently than it felt when I had a failure to fire. And the safety can be manipulated, which means the hammer is most likely charged or charged enough to allow the safety selector to be swept. Immediately I know this is not a failure to fire. And I may have felt the bolt stoppage as well during the cycle of fire, depending on how attentive or how relaxed I was in my firing condition, how many rounds I was firing, what the conditions I'm in, the environment, what have you. So now I've got probably what's a double feed based on the way that feels, but it could also feel like some other malfunctions, which we'll get to. So I wanna do some kind of check to see what I'm working with. If I don't have enough ambient lighting to see inside my chamber, I can roll the gun out and literally just stick my fingers in there and be like, okay, that feels like a double feed. And what is our clearance procedure for the double feed? Well, just for safety's sake, I'm gonna go ahead and lock that bolt to the rear. If the bolt carrier group doesn't move, that tells me that there might be something else going on with the gun, such as a bolt override, and that's something I want to pay attention to. But in almost every double feed I've ever encountered, the bolt carrier group is going to be able to be locked to the rear. That's our first step to stripping the magazine. At this point, I'm going to allow gravity to assist, do a forward, do a back, and then I can do a traditional racking, and now I can reload the rifle and get back to work. That tactile feel can lead us to believe one of three things. It can feel like a double feed. It can also feel like a, like a short stroke of stove pipe. If I reach up there and I feel one, one spent casing, you'll know it's spent because it's hot. I may be like, okay, I can just rack this and go back to work. I'm still gonna necessarily go through this procedure, especially in our night vision or when I have no ambient lighting because I can't actually physically see in the chamber and I'm relying on just my ability to feel inside the chamber. So I'm still gonna go through that double feed clearance procedure just for safety's sake. Another thing that's very, very important is to get that gravity assist chamber out of the magwell. You can also just go chamber, but if a round catches on the bolt face and you don't hear it fall out or you don't see it fall out because it's dark, it's another good idea to add in that up and down dip to help clear that. It just kind of simplifies the process and prevents you from inducing a totally different malfunction if there's still a live round or a spent casing bouncing around in there, you're not aware of it, and you try to stick a magazine in behind it. If I have ambient lighting, I can see. If it's daytime, I can see. If it's low light, no light, and I can't see physically see in my chamber with some lighting source, uh, then it's a good idea to do everything you can 
assuming that worst case scenario you didn't fully clear it so now i'm going to make sure i get in that gravity dip on both directions perform my clearance procedure reload the gun and check conditions my safety selector now sweeps everything's good to go Our next malfunction is a short cycle or a stove pipe, if you will. Somehow the bolt or bolt carrier group was able to catch a casing before it was able to fully eject from the gun as it went back into battery during the cycle of fire and it trapped it. The trigger safety selector is going to work. Trigger is going to be able to be pressed. Now after that, it can be a push pull and a rack and that's going to fix it. Uh, if it doesn't fix it, it's because the casing becomes stuck inside the chamber, which you'll see. And this is a big difference between setting up a malfunction versus doing one full power. Uh, showing you here, if it actually gets stuck in the chamber, then that technique is not going to clear it. And that's where that tactile feel comes into play. So my first attempt is probably going to be, okay, this feels like a failure to fire. I'm not going to do that chamber check. But something you might want to add to your practice, especially for low light, is even if you're like, okay, that felt just like a failure to fire, there's no harm in reaching up as you get ready to do your push-pull and checking that chamber condition. If you feel around, the technique is a little bit more complicated in the ways that I have to physically re probably remove that from the device or from the, uh, from the ejection port. So I can remove the magazine or not, it's really your call. Me personally, I can lock the rifle to the rear, reach up, clear it physically with my hand, make sure everything feels good, rifle back in the battery, ready to go back to work. The last malfunction we'll talk about is the one that scares people the most, especially if they haven't seen the simplified technique for clearing it, and that is a brass over bolt or a bolt override. Now this isn't a malfunction you're going to see on long stroke piston guns, uh, gas piston mass race. Uh, short stroke piston guns uh, such as LWC or even the HK416 can still have it, uh, but I don't want to say it's less likely, but I've seen it less on those guns than I've seen it on DI guns, especially home built DI guns by people who don't really know what they're doing. Uh, that seems to be some kind of contributing factor to the frequency of this malfunction occurring, but it can also be from encounter with the uh, outside environment uh, or ammunition related or, well, construction of the gun is usually the cause. So what's going to happen is in some way you're going to get a piece of brass above your bolt. And the best way to set it up, drop it in, get it seated nice right, and then just go ahead and hit your release. And that gives us a round that is above the bolt carrier group. At that point, I'm going to go ahead and insert my magazine. Now, if this happens uh, under full power, under actual fire, again, it's going to feel dramatically different than other malfunctions you encounter. Now, something about this. I get a dead trigger, but the safety can be swept, which can be a little strange. But as I start to clear it, I'm going to notice immediately that something is different by the fact that my charging handle does not readily move. So it doesn't feel like a double feed. Process can be roughly the same until I get to this point when I try to pull that handle back. Maybe I've already gone into this position and I'm trying to claw it back and it won't move. I can do a tactile feel and that's my first step. Two clues. First clue is going to be how far forward the bolt carrier group sits during the malfunction. It's going to be a little bit different than most double feeds I've ever encountered. It's going to sit further forward. The second is as I go to pin my, my paddle and work that charging handle, there's a lot of resistance there. So now I have to be like, okay, this is probably a bolt override and I have to go into a completely different clearance technique. The magazine can be removed, no problem. I can ditch it, get rid of it, whatever I'm going to do. I'll go ahead and pin that bolt release, bolt catch, and then I'm going to start to work the handle back and forth. If that doesn't work, I'll pull it back as far as I can and hit it forward, and there goes my round. Now my rifle is ready to go back to work. Now that clearance technique was new and amazing to you, you can thank guys like Mike Pannone and John Chapman. I don't really know where it came from. It may have been Mike Pannone, may have been John Chapman, may have been somebody else. Most of these techniques who actually came up with them was lost to time, but not all of them. Uh, the old military method was to collapse the stock and mortar the hell out of the gun, kickstart it, do all this crazy shit. And that's just working uh, harder, not smarter. So it's not something you really have to do. The one thing to remember about clearing malfunctions when you're not gonna have visual input is to do so in a way that you can actually feel and learn what these malfunctions feel like. Not only can I manipulate the safety, do I get a trigger press, do I get a dead trigger, but what the chamber actually feels like when you stick your digits in there and check it out. If you wear gloves, especially this is something you need to practice, 
especially if you use your rifle in an occupational role in low light conditions. If you work night shift and you have a patrol rifle, you should know how to fix these things without visual input, even though, let's be honest, you're probably gonna have some sort of ambient lighting, some sort of light pollution that's gonna at least let you visually verify, uh, but it also helps to learn what it's gonna look like. If you take a low light rifle class, uh, hopefully your instructor covers these as well. If not, come to me, I will. Uh, give us that ability to diagnose these malfunctions under low light because, well, low light is not an advanced skill. Uh, anything you do during the daylight, you should be just as proficient with as night at night. It's just complicated by the fact that most people don't have the ability to practice live fire at night. Low light classes are generally expensive or cost prohibitive at least compared to just shooting on your own. Uh, but it's still something we need to focus on because there's this idea, I guess, and not everybody shares it, that low light skills are somehow advanced. They're not. It gets dark every single day, and any time during the day you can find yourself in an environment that is low light, depending on what kind of structure you're in. So I kind of hate the idea that somehow you got to be a tactical Timmy in order to do low light stuff. Absolutely not. Everybody should be competent in low light skills. And this is just one more thing. If you've got a rifle set up for home defense, and it's in the bedroom, which probably means if it's going to be used, it's going to be used at night, not necessarily, but most likely to least likely, uh, you should be aware and proficient with the clearance tech. Uh, the only malfunction that can happen, uh, realistically, uh, without any rounds fired is that failure to fire. That can be literally the first run on the gun. Every other malfunction you encounter can occur, will occur at least after one round has been fired, which can complicate things. You think about the situation where you're only able to get one round off and then you run into a malfunction. That's kind of scary. So be proficient and also make sure that your gun is not one that you're, uh, you're kind of too emotionally invested in, like it malfunctions occasionally, you shouldn't have a rifle that malfunctions occasionally. You should have a rifle that malfunctions rarely. So if you built it and it malfunctions occasionally or somewhat frequently and you're trying to blame it on ammo and you keep seeing it regardless of what ammunition you shoot out of it, my advice to you is take that rifle to a competent gunsmith or get rid of it and get a better gun. I'm Eric Count with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.